You are listening to 1.0 with Bobby Lee and Jake. Hi everyone and welcome to the program. Today we have a special guest who is part of the Mortal Kombat 2 and Mortal Kombat 3 video games of the 1990s. He is a fitness instructor. Please welcome to the program, John Parrish. Yes, good afternoon everybody. Or good <laughs> evening as I would say. <laughs> Awesome. So, John, uh, we were curious about um, how early on in development you became aware of the Mortal Kombat project. Um, in particular, did you have anything to do with Mortal Kombat 1, or were you pulled in during the beginning of Mortal Kombat 2? Uh, I was aware of uh, Mortal Kombat 1 when it was just about complete, when they brought the first demo game into Lake Shore Athletic Club. But uh, my character and myself, we were inducted uh, directly in the Mortal Kombat 2 when it first, uh, you know, right after 1. And did they go directly into production after that? That was kind of my understanding that MK2 was basically greenlit almost immediately after MK1 was released. Uh, uh, yeah, I would actually say so. Well, actually, probably, yeah, probably like a month or two uh, uh, later, I mean, once they saw what the sales were doing on one, because remember the game, you know, according to Midway, the game, you know, was kind of like a bust, you know, because they wanted Claude Van Damme to do the game and he declined it. And, you know, they only um, had it slated to do X amount of cabinets and it exceeded that within, you know, the first month. And then next thing I know, we were already doing, you know, the but two were coming out. Yeah, yeah. When we had Daniel on uh, a couple weeks ago, he had went through uh, quite a bit of information regarding, you know, how this all kind of came about and, you know, the fitness clubs that were involved. So walk us back through. How did you get involved with the project? Who did you know? And what was your background with them? Uh, well, let's see, we all were working at, well, I was working at Lake Strap Athletic Club as a trainer. And, you know, I met Danny and Tony and Rick Fabrizio there. Uh, intermittently, you know, when they'd be training, you know, at the club, give them a few pointers every now and then. Um, one day they were trying to do some box jumps for, well, I guess they were practicing something. And then I told them, I said, well, you're using, you know, that's not quite how you do that. And I was able to do, you know, a 45 uh, vertical and show them. And at my weight, you know, I mean, they're looking at, you know, looking at this big guy doing, you know, a jump that high, and they're like, oh, my God, you know, we didn't know you were going versatile. And I'm like, come on, you guys have been on me for, you know, almost a year now. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, you know, it came to a surprise to them, and uh, then Danny, uh, they brought in a demo game of Mortal Kombat 1 to the club, and came to get me to see how, you know, what did I think, what are my opinion on it. And, you know, of course, I'm a Miss Pac-Man, you know, person, one-dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was playing the game, I thought, oh, I think the kids would love this game. Then I made an off-handed joke by saying, oh, it's a great game, but it's definitely one thing is missing, and they said, what? I said, there ain't no brothers in the game. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the next day, they had to stretch a jack. And so they asked, you know, I asked them, I said, damn, he's Jack, who's going to play him? They said, you, if you want to. And I said, really? I said, uh, you know, hey, he said, yep. I said, I'm in. And uh, the rest of it is <laughs> So do you know, uh, when we were talking to Daniel, that essentially most of the Mortal Kombat games were originally based off of the Marvel Comics Iron Fist. So you're basically Luke Cage. You've been... Reborn again more recently on the Netflix specials. How do you feel like that, looking at your mirror twin on, on TV at this point? I haven't seen it yet. I haven't had the time to watch that series yet, but I saw the previews and, you know, I had no idea that it was going to be a series. I had no idea where Jack actually originated from. Mm -hmm. uh, they just used to be the sketch and, you know, and then they said, Jack, I said, well, you know, I have to make him like a major or something, you know, because I was in the military. So that's where, you know, the captain and the, you know, the, the title came from. And then, you know, when they got, you know, of course, in the last year when 
they really explain exactly, you know, the Luke Cage and all that. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's how you guys came up with the character. Because I didn't know in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so so how far did you go in your military career? Oh, sorry, buddy. You know. So going back to Mortal Kombat 2, the filming with Jax, how long did it take you to film your parts for that game? Uh, in Mortal Kombat 2, uh, I'd say cumulatively maybe six to eight hours over a period of two days or so. Um, but in Mortal Kombat 3, it was a lot longer. Probably do and Neil Samal Fartel the makeup they had to put on the arms, huh? <laughs> yeah, that was that's the long part. The moves are simple, you know, because uh, we just mimic whatever was in in two, except for we added a few more. But and you know, for them to paint my arms in, the makeup artist, you know, he was going based off of you know sight unseen. So he said him he's gonna paint somebody as as big as Danny or Tony Marquez. You know, so when he saw me, he was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I don't think I got enough <laughs> Were there any unique challenges to being of a different mask than some of the other characters? Like, I don't, I have no idea standing you next to Daniel. I haven't met the both of you before, but um, were there challenges that Daniel had to face in order to incorporate you and your size and the way that you moved? to work alongside all the other characters that were were already present for the game? Oh, uh, well, no, because everybody was shot individually, so height adjustments were done by uh, the programmers. Mm. Uh, um, you know, uh, because, I mean, we never shot character and character together. It was always everybody was an individual character. And then once placed into the, the backdrop of the game, the heights were adjusted. So everybody looked at about the same height. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I would at that time I was the tallest one and the biggest. But the, you know, like I said, the moves we, you know, I mean, we had to do every single move. So all of the backflips I had to do, the jumping chase, until you know, like I said, we just slow down. I said you can't slow down the flip. <laughs> mm-hmm. Float, as I was told. <laughs> Yeah. So do, you, do you know how the idea for the metal arms even came up? The metal arms? Well, we were, I don't know, I know exactly how the idea came up, but I didn't know what they were going to be. Um, because we were, after Mortal Kombat 2 was released, and everybody was brainstorming about, you know, special powers. And I kept throwing out there, I said, you know, why does everybody get special powers but me? You know, that little boomerang thing and the ground bound, I believe a little bit something more. And uh, uh, next thing I know, some kind of way they came up with metal arms, and I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds cool. Now I get to really beat the shit out of somebody. But exactly <laughs> what the storyline, at that time, there was no storyline. That didn't come to later. Okay, so this is you know, uh, the arms. Yeah, it's like a lot of people said, oh, yeah, this is, you know, like the game had a storyline. No, the game never had a storyline. We were just throwing a lot of different things at it. We were all co-contributors of the game. So right. we would have a bunch of ideas in a room and, you know, and some stuff got in the game, some of it didn't. But later on, all of a sudden, you start seeing books and comics and storylines evolve, you know, around but somebody perceived that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's really phenomenal. Every time I look at uh, the history, especially since we talked about Daniel, it, it gave us a whole new dimension of what this uh, phenomena really was. And I imagine that there's an impact of you on Jax and probably vice versa. Has the, how has Jax changed your life? I don't know. <laughs> 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 about it. Um, it was fun to play the character and, you know, each one, everybody's character is a piece of themselves. Mm-hmm. That's what makes the game truly unique. So, Jack's being military, you know, special forces and I was in the military, you have to bring, you know, that was, that's just my persona even 25 years later. 
You know, I mean, if, when people look at my Facebook and see how I train and everything I do, that is the same mentality that carries on into the character Jack. Mm-hmm. You know, like Danny's character when he plays uh, Johnny Cage. Yeah, that's, if you look, look at Danny when we go to convention, he just like Johnny Cage, the Hollywood film boy guy. <laughs> <laughs> So how tied in are you with the original crew? Do you guys still spend a lot of time together? Or is it just a few of you still? Or how does the how is the relationship evolved well, since that time? For the most part, no. We all uh, we speak very frequently, except for like um, uh, the main people who speak: me, Danny, Tony, Phil, uh, and Rich, and um, Liz, who plays Sonya. We speak more frequently because we do most of the convention. So we travel in pairs or in triplets to different shows. Plus, you know, we're down there at a uh, Gallup and Ghost Arcade with the, uh, the Gamma, the gym. So we're all, you know, me, Danny, and still a part of that. So we see, you know, and speak and discuss different ideas all of the time that way. Then you have uh, John Turk. We, you know, we talk via, you know, Facebook, via Messenger about fitness and uh, different speaking engagements. You know, revolving around the fitness industry and the wellness industry. Uh, Carrie, we see her, you know, only at conventions, but she uh, you know, a lot of art shows that she does, or she's traveling with her new husband. So. But for the most part, you know, yeah, a lot of us, I mean, we do interact quite frequently. That's cool. It's nice to know that 20, 30 years later, you know, you can start a friendship and work on something fantastic together and still have that connection so many years later. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, for a while, some of us fell off the planet, you know, during, uh, you know, after 94 or 95. But, again, when they came out with Facebook and Gallup and those stuff, and it pulled the sweat back together again. So here we are. <laughs> Who is your favorite actor to work with? Uh, you know, Danny is, uh, you know, he's my favorite person to work with. I mean, we do a lot of traveling together. Uh, yeah, he's part of, yeah, <laughs> he's a, yeah, because, I mean, we just have so much in common. Even though politically we're in left and right, but... <laughs> <laughs> we get along, you know, just perfectly because, you know, like I said, I travel with him more often than anybody. You know, plus, you know, he was the one who brought me in, and he's the one who did all the choreography for everybody. So, you know, right. besides John Pius being the, the primary artist uh, and the 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 guy who thought up the game, it was Danny who took that idea and molded it, you know, with all his extensive knowledge in martial arts and, you know, and the, the movie genre that, you know, he put it all together. So, yeah, I admire that. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, he has done his probably my most favorite, you know, the one all of the time. Cause, like I said, I'm, I'm around him all the time and we try it all the time. So. <laughs> Very close friend of mine, uh, me. We're talking about the show that we had done with Dan not too long ago. And he was never a fan of Johnny Cage. And I was telling him, no, Dan's a really, really interesting character. Like, it's okay. You don't have to like Johnny Cage. But I'll tell you, Daniel Pacina did some amazing stuff. And he was really doubtful. But uh, one of the nicest comments I got after the program was, I have a newfound respect for Dan Pacina. And I thought it was neat that he used that rather than Johnny Cage. After a while, you kind of known for the name that everybody knows you as. Uh, yeah. I have to say it. Oh, please. Yeah, Go ahead. You don't understand you separate the character from the actual person. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, he thinks of Johnny Cage as the guy in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. that's the yeah, that's what he's thinking of. He's not thinking of who Johnny Cage actually is. That wasn't our idea when they designed the movie. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> It would have been kind of different if he would have been at least consultant in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he did a much better job than the jacks that was used for Mortal Kombat Annihilation, I have to say that. So uh, one of the things that I looked at going onto your Facebook today, and I was trying to find out on Wikipedia, man, there wasn't a heck of a lot specifically on you other than what we saw in the convention circuits. 
but I ran across a couple of things that kept being repeated. And one of them was um, an organization called CLIQ, C-L-I-Q-U-E. Can you tell us a bit about that and what uh, what you've been working on with them? Yeah, CLIQ Nutrition uh, is a sports supplement store uh, similar to GNC, except we're not a giant corporate conglomerate, and it's not supposed to be. Um, they are my sponsor for all my bodybuilding and uh, obstacle course races. So, but I'm more involved with them now because I'm also their uh, athletic uh, sponsorship uh, manager, and I designed the website the main company. So I have a staff that helps me with that. So, I mean, so, so you can just imagine like a vitamin top or GMC, but we're just not as big as that. You know, so we're still pretty much want to keep it local. Uh, Everybody who's an athlete, sponsored athlete, actually has an input into the store itself, you know. And, there's, you know, we have three different locations and about to open another one along with the gym out here in the western suburb of Chicago. So that is a very exciting thing, you know, especially for the future. I don't, you know, I don't intend to compete forever, but better give you never know. <laughs> I don't know. It's amazing. You know, John, um, like, a few years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes, and it was a really rough go. At the time, I was 420 pounds, and I had dropped tons and tons of weight over the course of a couple of years, and I kind of stabilized around 315. And I remember around that period of time, I started, you know, getting in touch with a lot of the stuff that I grew up with that I really appreciated, and I had remembered when I saw you at a convention uh, somewhat recently, you had looked incredibly fit, but it had only been a, maybe a year before I had popped in uh, my old Mortal Kombat Armageddon disc, which uh, had some interviews between you and some of the other cast members, and I was amazed. I was like, wow, you know, this guy's always paid attention to fitness, but like everybody else, there's a point in life where it kind of lulls a bit, and then you're right smack dab back to where you were, if not in better fitness than I'd seen before. And that was, you were one among many people that inspired me to try to get better into shape and such. And uh, I just, I think it's phenomenal that you've been able to produce such amazing results over the last few years, especially. So what um, what brought you from? Because I think I saw some pictures of when you were doing like a computer-based, I don't know if you still do it, but like a computer-based company. And there weren't very many photos of you at that time, but I think that was about the time you started having a turning point. Can you talk about that a bit? Um, yeah, that was probably when I was, uh, you know, after we did Mortal Kombat in 94, I had my last body competition in 94, and, you know, I stopped personal training. I stopped basically fitness, and, you know, got with my wife, you know, Went back to school, became corporate IT, you know, collected a few degrees, then sitting in the office, and became just like everybody else. And you sit behind computer terminals all day, you know, 10 hours a day, home, have a couple of drinks, happy hour, eat donuts, and watch movies. And you do that for about, you know, 15, 20 years. The next thing I know, I was 268 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with 52% body fat. And uh, me and my, uh, well, my mate, well, he was a mate, well, you know, he was talking about the new gym opening up around the corner, nine ninety nine a month. And I was just procrastinating. I'm like, you know, I really, I really don't want to go that route again because I get obsessed with it. You know, I know what's going to happen. I know I need to, <laughs> but at that time I didn't. Then I went to the doctor and uh, he gave me, like, Five different prescriptions, you know. You said I was borderline diabetic, hypertensive, high cholesterol, arteries are starting to clog, you know, definitely overweight. <laughs> and uh, every one of those drugs was on the commercial 1 800 bad drug. And at that moment, I said, no, 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 I'm going to change this. We're not going out like this. And I just went back to old school years. 
And then I started teaching everybody, you know, back in my office, you know, how it is done. And when they start seeing me transform day after day after day, eating healthy, eating clean, then everybody else started to do it. And, you know, then I got recertified as a trainer and a coach and a specialist and a quick corporate. And I've been doing this uh, since full time since 2016. Uh, and I compete in many shows. It just started off just getting healthy. And then I started running obstacle course races, and then somebody talked me back into bodybuilding, and there you go. I've been in it ever since. And just had one of my athletes I coached. Uh, he won last night three of the four uh, weight classes. And uh, that was his second show. So, and, and I tell people, I say, it's, it's really not rocket science. I say most people overthink it. I say you don't really diet. You just eat clean. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I agree that that's something that I finally learned, you know. And when I look at your pictures, I it's funny, I think when when we're unhealthy, that's actually when we're the most vain, or at least that's when I was. And as soon as I started getting healthy, like I looked at your photos today and I thought, Man, I didn't think, Oh wow, Jax is in the best shape of his life. That's that's you know, there, but really I thought was, he looks so happy. He looks like he's having a really good time in life. And it's, it's really nice to see that. Yeah, I mean, like, that's what I tell people. I say, when you get healthy and fit your whole mind, the class changes. Mm-hmm. So your priority is you first and foremost, and then everything else becomes secondary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, my son always asked me, he said, you know, why did I start competing again? I said, well, that was just a natural order of, you know, lifting weights and being athletic. I said, but it started off, I just wanted to be healthy. I said, you got four kids, and I got four grandkids. So, you know, and I said, the question is, how long do I want to be around, and what quality of life do I want to have? You know, I said, you know, I see a lot of people overweight, hard to get upstairs, they get depressed. You know, and you know, it goes downhill. And I said, I don't want to be on the downhill for it. It's not fun. <laughs> well, it's really an inspiration. I want to pass the ball back over to uh, Bobby, because I'm sure he's itching to actually ask you some questions. But uh, I'm going to take a little step back and let him take over here. How long do you work out at the shape you're in? How long, well, how long do I work out at Gary? Uh, well... Being a group instructor, <laughs> uh, each one of my classes is about 50 minutes. So today I've already worked out a total of 80 minutes. So I've trained with my team. But normally if it's just, if I'm just working out myself, it's no more than an hour. Okay. And that's just for weights. And then of course you get cardio, but I mean, if I'm doing weight training, I, I work no more than an hour. If you work more than that, that means you're diddle dialing in the lounge, talking on the phone, uh, you're bullshitting. You know, if you really, if you truly do it right, working legs, back and chest, hard, you are done an hour. You should have no energy. If you're working biceps, triceps, shoulders, that's about 15 minutes for each one of those body parts and you should be out. You know, cardio, no more than 25 to 30 minutes a day is all that is required about three or four times a week, and let the diet take care of the rest. And when I compete, it gets a little bit different. You think about competing, Jack? Yeah, when I compete, like in prep, because prep, it means that you start to cut down and get ultra rip for the stage, and that's about a 10-week process, and then my workout comes two times a day, about an hour a piece. Then I add cardio into it. And since I train, since I teach, I don't really have to add cardio because that's already included. So, you know, total time in prep working out in the gym, it'll probably be, like, say, if I'm working chest and tries that day, chest will be done first, that's an hour, come back, teach a class, and then 15 minutes on triceps. So that's about it. If I work legs, the whole day is just dedicated for legs, and like I said, it's about an hour, and it's not much left. So, what you sometimes see on YouTube, guys working two, three, four hours, I no. You, if you worked out with me, you wouldn't last that damn long. Neither would I. <laughs> Not the way I work out. 
I said I need to get that type of motivation. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean like I said, it, it's not rocket science. I mean, if right. you uh, focus on it uh, and what you're trying to do, you get in, get out, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't speak to nobody when I'm in the gym unless I'm finished. Um, I, if I have headphones on, that means that it's pure music. It's not attached to a phone. Uh, phone, there's no phones on the floor with me. <laughs> I mean, that, that goes for all my clients, too. We don't bring none of that on the floor. We are there to work. We've got a goal, a mission, and we focus. And that's so the hardest have, thing for a lot of people to do. Do you ever have people that randomly come into the gym and recognize you as Jax from the series? Oh, they don't recognize me from the video game, but, you know, word gets around that, you know, Jax, you know, who I am, especially in a lot of the gyms lately, everybody... You know, they you know, my, cause my clients tell everybody, oh yeah, by the way, yeah, I train with Jack. You know, people say, what, the guy from the video game? They say, yeah, next thing I know, you know, people are, you know, they come in and say, I hate to bother you, but are you Jack from Mortal Kombat? You know, I'm like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. a lot of fun. You know, but other than that, you know, no, people don't like, I mean, back in the 90s, they recognized this, but, you know, 25 years later, you know, Unless you were in, of that generation, you know, kids won't recognize anything. They think it's cool what they find out. When, when we were promoting the show last night, um, I had posted a picture of you from uh, Mortal Kombat 2, and a friend actually said you looked like Mike Tyson in your Mortal Kombat 2 picture. How, what do you think about that? I've heard that. I'm like, no, I don't look like Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, maybe maybe because I have wide shoulders or something, but no, I did not look like Mike Tyson. <laughs> you just, you just got to get the face tattoo next. <laughs> no, there's, there's not, some pretty distinct pictures of you. No, not using my face tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even think of a direct comparison right now, but definitely not Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson's face has turned to meatballs a long time ago. I mean, if you look at me now, I mean, you might say like The Rock or Vin Diesel, but not a Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when when he said that, I was like, I don't see it at all. And I told him I was going to bring it up. And he's like, no, please don't. <laughs> you know, one of the things I was amazed by was uh, the number of projects I've seen you connected to and where they all kind of sit in your timeline. How many different projects are you currently working on between Click and, um, I'm sorry, the name escapes me for the moment, but the fitness program where you do the personal training? How many different things are you working on right now? Well, well that's kind of interesting. The Young Human Fitness and Click and the whole Mortal Kombat you know, convention and tour scene. I purposely had that goal before I left corporate. You know, because um, one, I don't like working for other people, and uh, I hate. It's not so bad working with other people. I don't like the politics in the office. I don't like to be micromanaged, and I don't like to be in one place for too long. <laughs> uh, so I figured out, even with my, you know, as uh, when I created the uh, Human Fitness, you know, it started off, you know, just giving advice. And because I had that website, the domain name, two years prior to me going live with it. To the listeners of 1.0, some of our audio was lost for John Parrish's interview. We're moving on to the next section when he discusses his motivations for what he does. Okay, right, sorry about that, John. That's all right. We're probably going to wrap it up in a few minutes, but I just want to cover um, your inspiration again, uh, the things that, you know, keep you driven, your why, and what's, what keeps you motivated in this career path that you're on now. Yeah, the recap, yeah, what keeps me motivated is my why, the why I do everything. You know, the... Of course, the goal is to be healthy, but not only healthy, but live a very free and mobile life as much as possible. 
And when I do that, when I help others, I inspire others. So that is my why. And I try to teach, I mean, I'm not only, you know, like a, a coach and a personal trainer, but I become like a life coach to a lot of my clients and friends. Uh, and again, like I said, I am not perfect and haven't mastered it, but, you know, the, the basis of it is don't sweat the small shit, you know. If it doesn't concern you directly, then don't worry about it. I mean, you see how everybody's crazy with the Trump derangement syndrome none. I said, really? If you mention his name, everybody goes off the handle. You have to ask yourself, why do you care? Okay, how does that truly impact your day-to-day life? It's nothing you can do about it. Move on. You have a life. Develop it. Understand it. Cherish it. Because you get only one of these lives. So why are you wasting your time on something that suddenly is not even relevant to you? And so, and, and I live like that you know, on a daily basis. And that's probably why I have all the energy I have and I can speak to other people and be involved in many projects and, you know, and all of these sports ventures and everything is because my brain isn't clouded with stuff that doesn't, you know, pertain to me. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. Don't sweat the small shit. Enjoy your life. Develop your life the way you want it to develop, not the way someone else wants. And don't ever follow in the group thing. Think for yourself and keep it moving forward. And that's all it is. Wise words from John Parrish, folks. John, it's <laughs> been an incredible pleasure to get to know you a little bit better and let our viewers, uh, you know, experience a little bit more of the behind the scenes and really how this legacy has impacted the various lives of the people involved. So I really, really appreciate you coming on to the show today. And uh, we really look forward to following up with some of the time. Uh, you can follow John on uh, Facebook, on his Facebook page. He's still working in competition sports. He's got a couple business ventures that are out. As we have discussed, there's a fourth story coming out very soon for a click, which he also sponsored, is sponsored by. All right, and don't forget, uh, everybody should come out to Mortal Kombat Con on October 27th and country uh, side at the Working Hotel. We're going to have the links in the description as well as where you can get in touch with John. Um, and thank you so much for joining us with Bobby Lee and Jacob at uh, 1.0, your podcast.